I'm Janice Molnar, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Child Care Services at the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this training. It seems like an eternity ago when COVID-19 began to ravage New York State. All of us were affected by this pandemic in one way or another. And even while New York moves forward with reopening, the impact of COVID-19 continues to be felt. As Governor Cuomo has urged us, we move ahead slowly with deliberation and intent. No, it's not as quick as some would like, but we all want to avoid backsliding to where we were in April and even early May. So we put one foot in front of the other and proceed on the path to reopening and re-engaging with children, families, and communities. On June 8th, a new guidance for child care and summer camps went into effect. Much of it is new and some of it is complicated. All of it will require your firm commitment to creative problem solving and doing what medical experts tell us is the right thing to do to keep children safe. Today's training walks through that guidance. I hope it will clarify what's in the guidance and address many of the questions that you and your colleagues have put before us. You've made it through some of the most challenging times many of us have ever experienced. More challenges lie ahead. But I am confident that by working together, we will succeed in making childcare even better and stronger than it was before. You have been and continue to be essential to the well-being of children and families. Thank you for all you do now and in the future. Hello, and welcome to the New York State Office of Children and Family Services Training, Guidance and Best Practices for Child Care Programs Operating During the COVID-19 Emergency. I'm Sherry Duchesne. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Casey Becker, and Sherry and I will be your co-hosts for this training, and we'll also be joined throughout by our organizer, Trish Geary. She's been giving you some of those really great updates uh, while you've been waiting for the training to start. She's also going to help us out with some of our polls throughout the training. So thank you, Trish, for joining us. We're glad you're here. And thank all of you for joining us for today's very informative training. Uh, Sherry, I'm glad to be here with you. It's very good to see you. Casey, it's nice to be here with you on this Friday afternoon. And Trish and all the providers sitting out there watching this as well. Now, Sherry, we're going to be covering a lot of ground during this training, and traditionally a chat feature would be open for people to go ahead and ask their questions and provide their feedback. However, our chat box is not open today, so could you please tell people how they can participate with us? Sure, Casey, and that's a really good question. If anyone has questions at any time during the training, please submit them to the Early Childhood Education and Training Program or ECETP mailbox at the address shown here on your screen. They will be reviewed as we go along and if we're unable to get to them live, someone from the team will certainly follow up with you in the coming days. And Casey, we've been getting lots of questions, so we, we like those questions, we like those examples, so please send them to the mailbox. Yeah, we, we really have. Um, and as Sherry did mention, examples. So we would also like to encourage everyone to use the mailbox as a way for you to tell us about different things you're doing in your programs, maybe in the areas of cleaning and sanitizing, or drop off and pick up, maybe your daily screening routines, or new ways that you're using your space. Again, please send those ideas to us via the mailbox so that hopefully we can share some of them throughout our time together. And in just a few short months, COVID-19 has completely changed the way we live and work. The implementation of social distancing practices, wearing face coverings, and modifications to our daily schedules and routines has really altered the way programs and providers look and operate. It sure has. Now, operating programs have been working closely with their regulators to obtain support, supplies, and to connect with resources. And today's conversation is meant to help strengthen those connections so providers and regulators can work together for the safety of themselves, the children, and the families. 
And Casey, as communities begin to reopen, there are a lot of guidance documents out there to help people remain safe by decreasing the risk of contracting the spread of COVID-19 in different situations. And our focus during this training is going to be on sharing some of the main points from the New York State Department of Health Interim Guidance for Operating Child Care document and providing you with ideas from the field that can help you put this guidance into practice. You know, Sherry, our hope really is to boil down some of this information for everyone and show them that, you know, a lot of this stuff is stuff they're already doing and they're really doing it well. It now just has some additional parameters around it. And it does, Casey. So we have several objectives to accomplish in our time together. And by the end of this training, you will be able to summarize the purpose of an emergency regulation, apply that information from the New York State Department of Health interim guidance to your program, distinguish which guidance is a requirement and which is best practice recommendation. Also, list your ideas and questions about the interim guidance and be ready to discuss those with your regulator. All right, Sherry, you just mentioned an emergency regulation during that and um, so I understand that this went into effect for all licensed and registered child care programs as well as legally exempt programs and that went into effect on June 1st of this year, 2020. Sherry, can you tell us a little bit more about that emergency regulation? Sure. So the new regulation can be found in point 15 under business administration and the management section of the regulations. And here's what it states. A child care program must operate in compliance with all emergency health guidance promulgated, taken from law, by the Department of Health in interest of a public health um, emergency during a design during a designated public health emergency, and there's a lot of language here, provided that during a designated public health emergency, any relevant emergency directives from the executive chamber or from the Department of Health shall supersede regulations of the office in the case of any conflict. And I'm sure everyone out there is also feeling this is a lot of information. It sure is, and it's also there on the screen for everybody, too. Um, so, Sherry, why was this regulation put into place? So, this is really important. It was put into place that in the event of a public health emergency like COVID-19, child care programs know that they are required to follow the guidance issued by the lead health agency, the New York State Department of Health, and or the governor's office. Now, as we all know, this is an ever-changing situation. Um, as new information becomes available, new guidance is issued. And we were just informed this morning that new guidance documents have been issued today. That's June 26th. So some of the information we share with you today will be new for a lot of us. Now, on June 8th, the Office of Children and Family Services electronically sent two documents to support the child care programs during the COVID-19 pandemic and they are the New York State Department of Health interim guidance for child care and day camp programs during the COVID-19 public health emergency, and the other is reopening New York child care and day camp programs guidelines. Now, OCFS refers to this document as the summary of guidance for child care and day camp programs. Mm. The Office of Children and Family Services electronically sent the updated detailed guidance documents today, June 26, so that is the full uh, guidance document and that was electronically sent this morning and if you did not receive these please reach out to your regulator or you can get them on your my activities page on the training portal now sherry in general what can you tell us about these documents so casey first off this guidance is not intended to replace existing applicable local state and federal laws regulations and standards this guidance also does not apply to overnight child care. These documents should also be read in their entirety and any questions should be directed to your regulator. It's also important to remember this isn't forever guidance. It's interim guidance and it's here to help us through the reopening New York phases. 
people are interested in obtaining the copies, they can visit the OCFS website or, as we said, find those on the My Activities page. Now, these documents can be overwhelming and sometimes confusing, so we want to break some of it down for you during this training so that we're all on the same page. So we're going to start with the Reopening New York Child Care and Day Camp Programs, which, again, some of you may have heard to refer to as the Summary of Guidance. Sherry, what can you tell us about this one? So Casey, just as you stated, it is a summary document. And as you can see here, it's divided by subject and then structured as a comparison chart with two columns, one containing a bulleted list of mandatory items and the other listing recommended best practice. And really for everyone sitting out there, this is a much more user-friendly tool that can be used for a quick reference. Now the other document, the New York State Department of Health Interim Guidance for Child Care and Day Camp Programs during the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency, that's a complete guide and it was created to provide owners and operators of child care programs and their employees, parents, guardians and visitors with precautions to help protect against the spread of COVID-19. Now Sherry, what can you tell us about this document? So this guidance is based on best known public health practices at the time of its publication. And we know practices are shifting and changing as we learn more. And they are only minimum requirements and employers are free to provide additional precautions or increased restrictions. Child care programs are accountable for adhering to all local, state, and federal requirements relative to child care programs and their activities. They are also accountable to staying current with any updates to these requirements as well as incorporating them into any activities and or their site safety plan. And we're going to get to that site safety plan during the training this afternoon. We sure will. Now this guidance is quite lengthy and contains a lot of information as we've been saying. So one thing that can help take a little bit of the mystery out of it is remembering three key words and those are must, should, and may. Now when you hear the word must in this guidance, that indicates a guideline is a requirement. You must do these things in order to be in compliance. And when you hear the words should or may in this guidance, that indicates something that represents recommended best practice. It's a suggested strategy to assist with mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Now, in these cases, you're not required to adhere to the recommendation, but it's still in your best interest to do so, especially when considering the health and welfare of the children and staff. So these are instances where there is some flexibility, and you might have options based on your program's specific needs. So also this interim guidance, it's grouped into three different categories, people, places, and processes, and uses the term responsible parties throughout. For the sake of this training, responsible parties will be referred to as child care programs, and that's all of you sitting out there viewing this right now. And remember, each of your programs, they're all unique. So there is no one-size-fits-way uh, all way to comply with the guidance. And during this section of the training, we'll be giving you some ideas to help you see ways you might be able to do things in your program. If you have questions or if you're unsure if your program can do things in a certain way, please contact your regulator to see what works best to keep everybody safe. Okay, Sherry, are you ready to get into this? I am. I think I know what time it is. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take a closer look at some of the guidance in each category. We're going to begin with people. So that sounds great. And we've certainly been getting lots of questions around the, um, these areas of the guidance. And we want you all out there to start thinking about things. So as I mentioned, we're going to start with a poll. Okay, great. Now, Trish, you ready? You're with us? You know I'm with you. I know. Um, so this first poll has to do with group size. And the guidance that just came out today, June 26, states group size must be limited to no more than 15 children unless a small regu regulatory group size applies, for example, toddlers or infants. So we're 
wanting to know from you if you think this guidance is a requirement or a recommended best practice. I will read that again. Group size must be limited to no more than 15 children unless a small regulatory group size applies, for example, toddlers or infants. The polls are open. I have a little dance going on in my head. Now, ladies, I'm not sure if you can see those buttons on your screen. Are you able to? Yes. Excellent. All right, I want to remind folks, this is anonymous. So it's a great way to take a, take a quick check on our knowledge. And Trish, we're, we're well over a minute into the poll. How are our responses coming along? Well, three quarters of us have responded already, Sherry. It is pretty tilted in one direction. Um, I can tell you that. It looks like only 31% of us haven't responded yet. Okay. All if right. you'd like me to, I'll go ahead and close that up and you can see what the results tell you guys. So um, let's clarify this then. This is a requirement because it says must be limited. In previous guidance, group size included staff, but the guidance says child care programs must limit groups to 15 or fewer children, excluding staff in a specific area, example, a room, at any given time. And really, this exclusion of the staff has been helpful. I also think that that number 15 is going to be helpful to folks as well, too. So we want to stress here that this new, um, the group size of 15, it does not override ratio. You are still required to follow the staff-child ratios and maximum group sizes as set forth in regulation. Very important reminder mm. there. So, Sherry, we've gotten some other questions in our mailbox regarding groups and group sizes. And I've got one here that says, if only one child is present from two separate groups, can those two children be combined in a room together at the end of the day if they socially distance? Okay, so the answer here is going to be no. Programs must ensure that different static or stable groups of up to 15 children have no or minimal contact with another or utilize common spaces at the same time. Um, so that's what we have there. Okay. So we've got another one here that says, is capacity for group family daycare still 12 plus 4? And is this guidance limiting the group family daycare license? I'm sure folks are concerned about capacity. And OCFS is not changing program capacity. The interim guidance requires all programs to take reasonable steps to reconfigure space to limit overall density of rooms to 15 or fewer children. Okay, Sherry, now you just mentioned reconfiguring space, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, what does this mean? What might it look like in a child care program? Yeah, it's going to look different from program to program, but certainly it could mean, and this is one example, putting up a barrier to split a large area into two spaces that could accommodate 15 or fewer children each. Or it could mean taking another look at the program space to see if there are areas that are not currently being used that could be used. So if a program is requesting to temporarily modify approved space, like in our first example, this may be able to be accomplished by conducting a virtual tour with your regulator or even sending photos to your regulator. But whenever a program wants to make changes to their approved floor plan, they must contact their regulator. The regulator will conduct an inspection and they're going to assess the space, update the floor plan accordingly. And programs must not utilize this space for child care until it has been approved by the office. Okay, another great reminder there. Okay, Sherry, I've got one more question here. Uh, this one's asking, what is the guidance for family daycare providers who have 
limited space for meal times and are unable to separate the tables six feet apart or stagger the meal times due to supervision needs? Very good question. It is a good question. And this is where we're starting to unpack the word static or stable. So static or stable groups of 15 or fewer children may interact and dine together. We're actually encouraging that. Separate tables are not recommended or required. Family daycare programs should never have more than eight children present at any given time. Wonderful. Now, another area under the people category that we've gotten a lot of questions about involves staffing, specifically the use of floaters. So we're going to do a couple more polls here, and this one is a series of two questions. So for the first poll, the interim guidance states, child care programs must ensure that employee and children groupings are as static or stable as possible by having the same group of children stay with the same staff whenever and wherever possible. And we want to know if you think this is a requirement or a recommended best practice. Again, you're going to hit the button of the answer you'd like to choose and then hit that submit at the bottom. And in a, in a, in a few moments here, we will check in with Trish. Yeah, I was just going to say at this time, I'll, I can reread that guidance uh, to see if uh, any that helps anybody make their decision. And the guidance does say, child care programs must ensure that employee and children groupings are as static or stable as possible by having the same group of children stay with the same staff whenever and wherever possible. So that helps me, Casey. And I think it helped other folks. We're down to uh, we're down to about a third. And I will just mention to the folks that may be using a phone. I know that sometimes these buttons do not appear on your phone, so please don't think that you know you're just not seeing something properly. I know that doesn't always happen. So I'm going to say the majority of people have probably answered. Ladies, shall I close? Most definitely. Uh, you didn't. Go. You didn't even give us a teaser there. We, we so we're completely surprised. <laughs> All right, so we have um, a, a lot of folks leaning towards the requirement, but we still have a majority of folks that are unsure or who weren't able to chime in on this poll um, if they were on um, a, a different device. So let's clarify this for everyone. The answer is this is a requirement, and I'm going to give you the rationale. I always like to have a rationale um, because it states must ensure that groupings are static or stable as much as possible. So there's that word, Casey, that we talked about earlier. Yep, there it is. And now we're going to move on to the second poll in this series of questions. Now this time the guidance says, child care programs should maintain a staffing plan that does not require employees to float between different classrooms or groups of children unless such rotation is necessary to safely supervise the children due to unforeseen circumstances. And in parentheses it says, for example, staff absence. Again, the question is, do you think this is a requirement or a recommended best practice? And again, that was lengthy guidance, so I will go ahead and that again. Child care programs should maintain a staffing plan that does not require employees to float between different classrooms or groups of children unless such rotation is necessary to safely supervise the children due to unforeseen circumstances, parentheses, for example, staff absence. Well, ladies, we're down to that magic about 30 percent number this is closer that, there's your teaser guys this is a little bit closer you let me know when to go ahead and close it i, I love when you give us a hint on what's happening <laughs> behind the scenes um i think we're past we're about a minute and 20 in so i think we have most of the respondents and remember um, as trish closes the poll you still have time to submit your answer you have about 15 seconds or 10 seconds there, Trish. You're pretty right? good with that estimation, Sherry. <laughs> About five now, so you were almost dead on there. Uh, all right. And here are our results. I should be able to share those with you right now. 
Oh, okay. So this one um, is so recommended best practice is leaning a little higher, but it, it's it's pretty close here. Um, so let's uh, let's tell folks. If you said recommendation, you are absolutely right, and that is because it says should maintain a staffing plan that does not require employees to flow. So let's dig a little deeper here and break this apart. And as I mentioned, it comes down to the use of the words must and should. So we just had two pieces of guidance. The guidance states that programs must ensure that groupings of no more than 15 children are as static or stable as possible. And that second piece was, and that they should maintain a plan that does not require employees to float. Okay, Sherry, so I am trying to process a lot of this myself as we go along. <laughs> and I was thinking that based on what you just said, is it safe to say that programs can't mix children, but they can move staff when that's needed? Casey, that is exactly right. Children cannot be mixed, but adults can move. And really, the intention behind this recommendation to not float staff is to limit exposure within your program whenever possible. All right. So that really helps me when I'm trying to make sense of all of this, you know. And it's really clear to me now just how important paying attention to those words must should and may really are throughout this guidance. And Sherry, you and I have talked about this a lot, and um, I really liked it when you gave me that recommendation about using a highlighter, and I was hoping you could share that with everyone. Yeah, right sure. Now. I think any tools that we can use to digest this and break this apart is really helpful. So, you know, we said you need to read this in its entirety. So when you're sitting down to read, pull out those highlighters, maybe some colored pens. I love gel pens. They're my favorite. And as you're reading, highlight the words should and must and may. And also make some notes for your regulator and, and reach out to them with the questions that you have. And I, I think that will help us to start uh, organizing the information and breaking it down in our minds and starting to digest that. Yeah, I really, really love that tip. And I really like using my little sticky flags oh. for, for, to mark places that are really important to me that I need to refer back to. Now, Sherry, I've got a question here from the mailbox. And it asks, um, let's see, if an example is used in the interim guidance, is that the only circumstance where the guidance applies? Yeah, so this is another great question. In the piece of guidance that we just talked about, it used staff absence in parentheses as just one example of a time when a program might need to use a floater. We know that floaters might be able um, to be used to cover staff breaks or just has an extra set of hands in a room doing a more involved activity. So we really encourage you not to get bogged down on the specific examples that are used in the guidance as being your only scenario. And again, I can't say this enough throughout the training. If you have questions, please, please contact your regulator. Great. Thank you, Sherry. I've got some other questions here from the mailbox, and these are asking about physical space and program configuration. And those areas fall under the people category in the physical distancing section. Now, Sherry, people are wondering if the required square footage per child has changed in any way. And I can definitively say no. <laughs> there have been no changes to square footage requirements. Okay, great. Um, another person is asking if a room, a large room, is big enough to accommodate two groups of, uh, they were asking 10 or fewer, and now we know with this updated guidance it would be 15 or fewer, can that room be split in half to create two rooms? And I like the creative thinking of this provider. That's a really great question. And the answer here is yes. So if a program has an area, for example, a large classroom, or even a gross motor room that can be reconfigured to safely accommodate two or more groups of 15 children or fewer, they may certainly contact their regulator to discuss the proposal. So that just spurred something in my mind, Casey. Okay. So if we're talking about barriers, I bet folks want to know, how high must the barrier be dividing the spaces? 
Okay, and that is an excellent question. Now, the guidance on that, Sherry, is silent regarding the height of the barriers between the groups. So if someone is considering using a barrier as a plan of action, um, they must contact their regulator for assistance because all of these situations, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and I imagine that there's so many different types of creative ideas for barriers, and that's exactly why it needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, um, it's important to remember that when it comes to keeping these group sizes of 15 or fewer in their own spaces, one option that we talked about, take a look at your space, speak with your regulator, and see as something that you are not currently using can be approved for use. Great. Now, Sherry, drop-off and pick-up times, we know those are some of the more hectic times in the day, especially if several families may be arriving at the same time. And social distancing has many programs changing the way they conduct drop-offs and pick-ups. So, Sherry, does the guidance say anything about drop-off and pick-up times? You know what, Casey? It does. And let me tell you, read what it states. Child care programs should put in place measures for child drop-off and pick-up procedures to allow for strict social distancing of six feet between parents or guardians and employees. And a child care program should consider, and I said should, consider staggering arrival and drop-off times. And both of those guidelines used what was the word, Casey? Should. That's right. So that means that this is a recommended best practice. Okay. So, you know, we recently had the opportunity to speak with some child care providers who have been operating um, to ask them about how they've been adapting some things. And they had some really uh, good ideas uh, that they shared with us about how they've adapted their drop-off and pickup procedures that we'd like to share with everyone in this video. So let's take a look. Our program looks different. I mean, it has to look different because of things that have changed. So there's a lot of things that we've had to rethink and the way that we're going to redo things. Um, at the place that we're currently working, there's a vestibule. So with our staff, we're able to kind of have parents sign in and out in the vestibule, limit the number of people that are coming into the program. So right at drop-off, um, you know, every morning, we, we have a staff that goes out. Um, does the daily health screen, takes the child's uh, temperature, and you know, then they come in and they're directed to go wash their hands. So when this first started, we had parents were always able to come in using a key fob, and then they would go into the rooms, their classrooms, different wings, get their child and leave. Then we went to uh, the parents coming into the lobby, then the teachers, we would buzz, or we would retrieve the children, bring them to the lobby, and then they would leave. But then that started, parents were arriving, you know, around the same time, so that became a little, you know, just not safe distancing. So now we have a, uh, we now bring the children, they're in their classrooms. We are fortunate enough where the classrooms have doors uh, leading to the outdoors so the parents go right to that door marked with a cone because there's different classrooms that are open and some classrooms that are not so all the parents at first were like this is going to be a hardship because we have a child on one on the left wing and we have a child on the right wing but they adapted and that's been working out nicely in fact the teachers are like can we do this all the time <laughs> Drop off, drop off, drop off. Drop -offs. Yeah, pickups. Uh, thank you to all those providers for sharing those great ideas with us. And I really like the way that uh, you know, they're continuing to be flexible as guidance comes in and they see, see that things maybe aren't working uh, as safely as they could. They're really continuing to adapt things. So that, that's really, really great to see. Now, Sherry, speaking of great ideas, we've received some others from the mailbox about drop off and pickup that I'd like to share at this time. We've got one from a provider of a family-based program, and she's asked the families to come at specific times whenever possible to help stagger the arrival times so that groups aren't gathering at the program at the same time. We've got another home-based provider who shared that she greets everyone outside the program in order to limit the traffic inside the program. 
depending on the way a program looks. This could be on a porch in a driveway, maybe a stoop or a landing. Um, and another home-based program has asked parents to limit the drop-off and pick-up person to the same person when possible instead of parents taking turns. And this helps limit the number of adults the children in the program are exposed to. We really appreciate everyone sharing all of their ideas with us, and we hope all of you out there find them helpful when you begin to look at your drop-off and pick-up procedures. So, Casey, we've gotten a lot of questions regarding visitors to programs, so guess what time it is again? Pull. I think it's my favorite time. <laughs> it, okay. is, it is poll time. Yeah. So this time, I'm going to read the question. So, the guidance states child care programs must prohibit non-essential visitors on site to the extent possible. Do you think this is a requirement or a recommended best practice? This was a pretty short question, something we could easily digest. I will read it one more time for folks. The guidance states child care programs must prohibit non-essential visitors on site to the extent possible. Is this a requirement or a recommended best practice? I love poll time. Me too. <laughs> a lot of folks do. Uh, in fact, this one they're answering pretty quickly, ladies. I'm going to say you're going to tell me with about 30% left to go ahead and close her up. I can tell you it's going in one direction. Casey, about I 15 think seconds. I know which direction it's going in. And I bet you and I agree. And that's pretty impressive because I can see the numbers. I, I can't. <laughs> I just, I just, not yet. I'm going to share those actually, guys, in a couple of seconds. Go ahead and click that submit button. And here's what everybody thought. I knew they would get it. That is just spectacular. So it is pretty overwhelming that this is a requirement. We do have folks who are a little unsure, and I do want to state that if you didn't uh, choose the correct answer, that's exactly why you're here in this training, to get this information. And for those of you who did, it's a great way to validate the knowledge that you've been absorbing. So this is a requirement because it says must prohibit non-essential visitors on site. Hey Sherry, we've gotten some questions asking about how this guidance um, pertains to some stuff. Just please hold. Uh, what kind of stuff? Um, they're asking about how the visitor guidance pertains to special education service personnel and therapists. I'm wondering if we have any thoughts on that. Okay, so I think folks are going to be pleased about um, what we have to say on this. So the guidance states non essential visitors that's special education providers and therapists, they are itinerant service providers. Therefore, they are considered essential visitors, so they are allowed. Not just providers, but families are going to be really happy with that one as well. And they are also required to follow all screening protocols and social distancing requirements. Okay, great. Now, along the same lines, I've got another question here asking about healthcare consultants and are they considered essential? So this one is, if the program deems an in-person visit by their healthcare consultant is essential to the program, so um, it would be a yes. And then remember, as we just said, all visitors are required to follow daily health screening and social distancing requirements. We are going to change gears here a little bit to talk about face coverings. Sherry, what can you tell us about those? So we all know that staff are required to wear face coverings at all times, both indoors and outdoors, when interacting with children, uh, regardless of the distance between the person and the children. But did you know that staff must also be trained. I bet a lot of folks out there did not know that. Um, so folks need to be trained on how to put on, take off, clean, and discard personal protective equipment or PPE coverings, face coverings. You know, Sherry, that is correct. Their uh, training is 
required and according to the interim guidance it can be found under the protective equipment category in the places section of the document it states child care programs must train their employees on how to adequately put on or don take off or doff clean as applicable and discard PPE including but not limited to appropriate face coverings. Now Sherry, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking to myself, where, how can we get this training? Do you have any thoughts about that? So folks will have several options here and I'm going to pull some information up on the screen. Um, first off, if a program has a healthcare consultant, they could certainly ask him or her to conduct the training for individual staff members or the CDC has videos on their website and that providers can watch these and it's at no cost to them. And also, I really like on the screen here, we're showing you some visuals. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. Um, I also need those reminders. So the CDC website has posters titled how to put on and take off PPE and face mask do's and don'ts love those visuals. I know, they're so wonderful, aren't they? Really so, um, I think we have another question here and it, um, about the training. So, uh, time frame, Casey, is there a time frame to get this training done? That's a really good question. Um, the guidance does not mandate how programs meet the requirement, nor do they specify a time frame for getting it done. But we do really want to remind everyone that the goal is to help stop the spread of COVID-19 in child care programs. So the sooner that providers can learn this information, the better it is for everyone. Okay, Casey, I'm seeing some more questions since we're on this topic of PPE. Some more general questions coming in. And this one is asking, can a face shield be used in place of a mask? Mm, that's another excellent question. Um, according to Executive Order 202.18, uh, that referenced that face coverings, including cloth masks, surgical masks, N95 respirators, and face shields. So face shields would be acceptable because it does say that face coverings include the cloth masks as well as face shields. Okay, Casey, I'm also saying our infant and toddler folks, they're weighing in about these face coverings. So this provider asks, how do those of us who work with infants and toddlers care for them while wearing masks? Babies rely on our facial expressions and our nonverbal communication. They, they really, really do. Babies, they need to see those faces and connect and build those attachments and relationships, especially during times of you know, feeding and diaper changes. So child care providers, they must, wear ma they must wear masks during caring for children. And it's impossible to socially distance during those times of diaper changes and feedings. Uh, but there are some creative options for providers when caring for infants. Um, as we just said, you could wear a face shield. Or um, I've heard that there are masks with transparent panels. Someone uh, told us about those recently. And that would allow the baby to see faces and everyone's still being protected. Um, so, you know, these clear face shields and transparent panels, they might also be helpful uh, for childcare staff who are hearing impaired and rely on lip reading to assist with communication. I also think the, the ones with the clear panels in them, um, I was out in the store the other day and the person didn't have it on so we couldn't see those facial expressions and the woman said, oh, I see your eyes are smiling. So um, those clear panels, they're not just good for little ones, they're, they're good for everybody. They sure are. <laughs> Okay, so um, you mentioned earlier, um, and I think we both mentioned this, that adults always need to wear face coverings. So let's segue right into what about children? Well, Sherry, children are not required to wear face masks in programs or while using outdoor areas that are exclusively used by the program. Okay, good information. And a home-based provider is wondering if her family members need to wear a face covering during program hours? Okay, that's a good question. Um, if 
those family members are interacting with children or staff in the program, then yes, they would need to wear a face covering. Okay, so I think we covered a lot about <laughs> face coverings. Sure did. Uh, so let's move to cleaning and disinfecting in the field, and we'll be in your health care plan. Um, you all have standards for cleaning and sanitizing toys and materials used by children. This may include the use of a bleach solution, which is a recommendation found in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC's Cleaning and Disinfecting Your Facility guidance document. COVID-19 guidance has asked everyone to intensify their cleaning and sanitizing efforts. And while you must follow this guidance, it doesn't mean, thank goodness, you do not need to redo your health care plan. That is good news. Um, so Sherry, those providers that we heard from a little earlier about their drop-off and pickup adaptations, they also gave us some information about how their cleaning and sanitizing routines have changed. So we want to go ahead and take a look at that now. Yeah, let's take a look. We just stepped it up a notch and we're cleaning toys, cleaning classrooms, closing certain classrooms down so deep cleaning can take place and more frequent uh, rug washing and, and intense cleaning. And it's a lot of sanitizing um, right down to the pens that the parents are signing in and out with. You know, we have wipes and we're wiping them down between each drop off and um, pickup. After each group is done leaving that area, they sanitize one staff stays behind and cleans. Um, so we we do a really great job with cleaning um, and just you know being aware of our surroundings. We have weekend staff also that comes in and does some deep cleaning as well. So and our teachers are troopers, they're constantly cleaning, constantly. <laughs> I don't know about you, Sherry, but I feel like I'm constantly cleaning as well. Oh, most certainly. There is a <laughs> lot of cleaning going on. Okay, Sherry, we've gotten some questions in the mailbox about cleaning and sanitizing outdoor areas. Um, and this first one says, if a family daycare has six children, can children play on the swing set together? And does the provider have to sanitize swings while the children are on them? So this one comes back to some of the language we were using earlier. The same stable group of 15 or fewer children most certainly can play together and we are encouraging that they play together. Providers should encourage activities that assist with maintaining social distancing, although with, with little ones it's next to impossible to do that. And playground equipment and or areas should be cleaned between use by a different group of children. And you know, I just want to back up the activities that would look like for maintaining social distance. You know, we wouldn't be doing a three-legged race, but this is a great time for hula hoops. That creates the, the nice distance and some, some other games where we don't have to be so close and um, close cooperative play. Those are great examples. And you know, as you were saying that, I was kind of thinking about a comparison that came to my mind that I was trying to figure a lot of this out and uh, brought this up with someone and they said that, you know, it really helped kind of make sense to them. They had kind of one of those aha moments. So I'm gonna see if I can uh, replicate that conversation a bit here. So I told this person that, you know, every day I'm in my house with the same group of people. It's me, my husband, and my daughter. And this is our static group within our home. You know, we eat together, we play games together, we hang outside on the hammock on those really nice days and read stories together. We've ramped up our cleaning, but you know, we're not following each other around just wiping things down after each person uses it. But if we were to move to a new house, I can tell you that I would top to bottom clean that environment before we moved in. Now the same idea can kind of be said for providers and, you know, their groups of 15 or less, you know, children, uh, these stable groups of children. So, you know, they are the same group of people in the same area using the same furniture and equipment, just like my family's doing in my house. Now, again, the cleaning needs to be increased to meet the guidelines, but, you know, it doesn't mean that children can't play together or that toys need to be wiped down before children in this same static group use them and share them. 
you know, areas and equipment, they only really need that thorough cleaning when that one static group leaves the area or stops using the equipment and another group wants to use it. Is that helpful? Certainly helping me. Um, folks out there, um, please chime into our mailbox and um, let us know if, if it's starting to become clearer or if you have more questions. Um, so yeah, it's certainly coming clearer. The more I talk about this, the clearer it becomes. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's making me think too back to our earlier discussion about how children can't move and how adults can. My daughter She's been at home and hasn't been going anywhere. She's, you know, being homeschooled. There's no play rehearsals. There's no swim practices. There's no play dates. She's not moving. But my husband, on the other hand, he's moving every day. He's going to work. He's going to the grocery store. And he's, you know, sometimes even going to restaurants to pick up food for us for dinner. So does that help? Well, you know what, Casey? I think I'm going to have an aha moment right here. <laughs> Um, is your husband, could you compare him to a floater? I, I think you could because <laughs> he's able to move around where my daughter, who's the child, is not. So, yeah, that's, he's my floater. He's your floater. <laughs> I'm sure he's going to love that new title. <laughs> uh, not sure I'm going to share that with him. Um, so, Sherry, we've got another question here about the, again, outdoor environment and cleaning. And this one comes from a school age program and uh, they tell us that they've been cleaning their playgrounds in between groups. Yay, that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but they're wondering what is the responsibility when the public uses that space, that outdoor space? Okay, so let's, um, we have a couple things to look at here. The outdoor space that belongs to and or is exclusively used by the child care, that is not considered a public place for the purpose of this guidance. Um, children are not required to wear a face covering when utilizing the outdoor space that belongs exclusive, exclusively um, to um, or is used by the child care. If this play area is not exclusively used by the child care program and is also used by the public, that's when this changes. The children would be required to wear face coverings if social distancing from the public cannot be maintained. And the program is required to clean play equipment before children can utilize it. That's because a different group was there. So you're bringing your static group to a public place. You would want to um, follow the proper procedures for sanitizing that equipment. Wonderful. Thank you, Sherry. Um, and again, we just want to remind everyone to please keep sending us your amazing ideas and your questions uh, to our mailbox, ecetp at albany.edu, so we can continue to share those. Great. So um, let's move to under the hygiene, cleaning, and disinfection category of the places section. And the interim guidance states that child care programs must maintain logs that include the date, time, and the scope of cleaning and disinfection. And OCFS has um, helped you, is they're helping you to meet this requirement and they've developed a new form called the OCFS 6041 and it's the cleaning and disinfecting log. However, programs may use their own. And for those of you who are interested, please go to the OCFS um, website to find this form. Okay. Now, Sherry, as we're talking about this, we've got a question here from the mailbox asking if providers can use Clorox wipes to clean. Good question. Any thoughts? It is a good question, and we're going to send folks um, to, to the guidance. So programs must ensure adherence to hygiene and cleaning and disinfection requirements as advised by the CDC and the New York State Department of Health, including guidance for cleaning and disinfection of public and private facilities for COVID-19, and also stop the spread poster as applicable. And remember, child care programs must maintain logs that um, include the date and time and the scope of cleaning and disinfection. Great. 
Now, everyone is already used to performing daily health checks on awake children as they arrive at the program. And in the screening and testing section of the processes category, the interim guidance also requires screening of all adults as well as children. Now, it states child care programs must implement mandatory daily health screening practices of their employees and visitors, such as contractors or vendors. Screening is also mandatory for children, either directly or through their parent or guardian. I jumped the gun there. <laughs> that's okay. In addition to conducting the screening, the guidance also mentions maintaining a log. And it states, to the extent possible, child care programs should maintain a log of every person, including employees, parents, guardians, children, and any essential visitors who may have close or proximate contact with other individuals at the worksite or area, excluding deliveries that are performed with appropriate PPE or through contactless means. Now, the log should contain contact information such that all contacts may be identified, traced, and notified in the event an employee, parent or guardian, child or visitor is diagnosed with COVID-19. Child care programs must cooperate with state and local health department contact tracing efforts. Now additionally, it states that child care programs must review all employee and parent or guardian and children responses collected by the screening process on a daily basis and maintain a record of such review. Programs should designate a central point of contact, and this person may vary, by activity, location, shift, or day, and that person's responsible for receiving and attesting to having reviewed all employees, parents, or guardians, and children questionnaires. And this contact also will be identified as the party for employees and visitors to inform if they later are experiencing COVID-19 related symptoms as noted on the questionnaire. I was wishing I had my highlighter there. <laughs> um, so OCFS is really helping us out in this because there's a lot to manage and they've created a new form and it's the OCFS 6039 and that's the Child Care Program Tracker as an option to assist you with logging and review of your screenings. Now, if you choose to use this form, it should be used for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic to record the date, the printed name, phone number, purpose of visit, the daily COVID-19 screening, time of arrival, and time of departure of any employee, visitor, parent, guardian, or individual who enters the child care program. And really, this information will help with tracing of any COVID-19 cases that may be confirmed in your program. And it's also useful because, I love a dual purpose form, it meets the requirement of programs keeping a daily health record um, of those daily health screenings. So um, it, it has many uses, this form, and I really do wanna take a second just to remind folks, this is, this is interim guidance. It's not forever. So um, please keep that in mind. That, that is a really great, important reminder. Now, Sherry, as we said a bit earlier, screenings are a requirement for all who enter the program. However, there are options when it comes to how the screenings are performed. And they can be conducted remotely or on site. So we have two types, remote or on site. And I guess we can see where we're going. We're going to start with the remote screenings. Can you walk us through that, Casey? Sure. So remote screenings are screenings that are done before any child or adult arrives at the program. Now, OCFS has developed an attestation form. You can see it on the screen there. And it is the OCFS 6040. And employees, parents or guardians, and recurring essential visitors, such as itinerant service providers, they will sign and submit to the program this form saying that they will complete a screening with a temperature check every morning. Now there are two signature lines on the form so that two parents can fill out just one attestation form rather than each parent having to fill out a separate one. And the form only needs to be completed and submitted once, but it does attest that the parent or guardian will complete the screening of him or herself and the child or children 
every day before arriving at the program. So Casey, um, I'm also thinking, you know, having paperwork on ready and on file is so important to our providers that they have everything done appropriately. So what are they to do if someone arrives at the program and they don't have this attestation on file? That's an excellent question. Um, if there's no attestation on file for that person, uh, that person will need to be screened using the program's on-site screening procedure before they are allowed to enter. And we are going to talk about that on-site screening process after we finish up our discussion about remote screenings. And I just want to remind people if, you know, the person who's come in and doesn't have this attestation on file, if they are a recurring visitor or they are a parent, Go ahead and give them that attestation form if you're using it because, you know, they can fill it out right there or they can take it home and fill it out and bring it in. So it really will take, you know, like one, you know, step out of it. They can do that before they get there. Now, once that uh, people arrive at the program, the employee, parent or guardian or essential visitor will log that the screening has been done by checking that yes box under the daily COVID-19 screening heading on the OCFS 6039, that program tracker form, or uh, if you're choosing not to use that form in an, an equivalent form. So that's for the adults. They, they have that attestation, they've done their screening, and you check that box on that tracker form for the adults. So for the children, then the child care provider would ask the parent or guardian about how the child screening went and then log that that was completed on the OCFS 4443 attendance form or its equivalent. So there's two forms there to make sure that we're logging this. You've got the tracker form for the adults and you've got the attendance form for the child. Okay, great. So let's also take a little look at the attendance form because um, I did want to point out that this form has just been updated to include this daily COVID-19 screening checkbox and also a no-show box has been added. And this is to remind providers to reach out and call the parent or guardian of a child who they expected to have in care but who has not arrived in care. Completing this checkbox is certainly optional and not required in regulation, but by filling it out and following up, it can help keep lines of communication open, and its goal is to help keep children safe, especially when trying to prevent vehicular heat stroke deaths in children who may be left in hot cars. So important. So Casey, I'm still, I'm, you know, lots of information. I'm digesting this and um, folks um, out there viewing this may be wondering it as well. What if someone forgets to do the screening at home? It's, you know, challenging getting out of the house in the morning with little ones. So what should we do then? Well, that's a great question. So if someone does arrive at the program and says they forgot to do it, the program will need to follow their uh, screening process for on-site screening uh, following the program's specific procedures for doing on-site screenings. So just to reiterate, because we know we just put a lot of information in front of everybody, if a program chooses to implement a remote screening process, the requirements of that process will be met if they use the three forms we've just discussed or their equivalents. And those three forms, again, are that attest attestation form, the attendance sheet, and the tracker form. So if you do use all three of those forms together, you will meet or remote screening requirements. Okay, so this is certainly becoming clear. Three forms, remote screening, I meet the requirements. Correct. All right, so Casey, let's move to our on-site screenings. Okay, so on-site screenings, those are screenings of all children and adults, and they are completed at the program. So we're gonna walk through one example of how this could be done. So to start staff, if they choose this route, would ask the parent or guardian the four questions that can be found on the attestation form. And those are, is your temperature greater than or equal to 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Have you had any known contact with a person confirmed or suspected to have COVID-19 in the past 14 days? Are you currently experiencing any of the following symptoms? New or worsening cough, new or worsening shortness of breath, 
new or worsening trouble breathing, fever, chills, new or worsening muscle pain, new or worsening headache, new loss of taste, new loss of smell. And then the last question, have you tested positive for COVID-19 through diagnostic tests in the past 14 days? Now in accordance with New York State Department of Health guidelines, anyone with a temperature over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or showing any of the COVID-19 symptoms we just listed must not be permitted to the program. And also, we just want to remind everyone, if you take temperatures yourself, please remember to follow proper safety precautions of hand washing, using gloves and face coverings, and cleaning the thermometer between uses. And remember, a new set of gloves should be used for each individual child. Very good reminders, Sherry. Thank you for those. Now, once the on-site screening has been completed by, uh, in our example, asking those four questions, the program then needs to record that it has been done. So again, using those forms we talked about a little earlier, you would use the LDSS 4443, the child attendance log, or its equivalent to maintain that log that the uh, screening had been done for the child. And you would use the 6039 tracker form to maintain that the COVID screening was done for the adults. All right, so remember the processes outlined above, these are just examples of how you can conduct screenings. You all know your program the best, so if you don't think these will work for you, we encourage you to come up with a way that will. And just remember, screening is not an option. How you do it, how you track that it has been done, that is an option. So Casey, I think we've got some questions here in the mailbox that, and um, let me see, this one is saying, so we've done our screenings at arrival, but as the day goes on, someone develops COVID-19 symptoms while they're at the program. You know, what, sh what should they do then? Oh, these are really great questions and we thank everybody for sending those in. Um, okay, so to start with, it's really important to remember that everyone needs to be aware of the COVID-19 symptoms so that we know what to look for and we can put a plan in place as quickly as possible to help stop the spread. Now, you can find the most up-to-date information on symptoms associated with COVID-19 in a document called Symptoms of Coronavirus, and that can be found on the CDC website, which is cdc.gov. And, you know, providers need to respond to people who begin to exhibit symptoms during the day. And, uh, you know, so in the event that a child becomes sick, the program needs to have a plan for separating the child from the group, calling the parent or guardian, you know, steps like that. But they also need to have a plan in place in the event that a provider or another adult in the program, if they begin exhi exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 so that they know what to do in that event. So it's really important to have those two plans, one for you know the child and then one for an adult. So Casey, I'm having another aha moment here. This would, be, an, this would be an ideal time to check contact information, the registration form, blue cards, and make sure that they're all up to date. Absolutely. Okay, Sherry, there's one more area of the guidance that we've gotten a lot of questions about and we want to talk about, and that has to do with exclusion policies. So what can you tell us? So the guidance under the screening and testing category of the processes section states, child care programs must instruct staff to stay home if they are sick and remind parents or guardians to keep sick children home. So if anyone is experiencing a fever of 100 or above or exhibits symptoms of COVID-19, and Casey just took you through them, he or she must be excluded from the program until they are fever-free for 72 hours without the use of medication and improvement of COVID-19 symptoms. 
Okay, now, you know, Sherry, many symptoms of COVID-19, they're the same as symptoms that someone with a cold or seasonal allergies might experience. So it's important to remember that when it comes to excluding children, to use your knowledge of the child to help make that decision. You know, ask yourself, are these symptoms typical for that child? Are they new or are they worsening symptoms? Uh, does the child have a known chronic health condition? So utilize the exclusion criteria in the health care plan as a guide for other childhood illnesses. And remember, the New York State Department of Health has given us that new definition of fever during the COVID-19 outbreak, as we've said a couple of times, and that is 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. But keep in mind that other parts of your health care plan remain valid. Just remember that in the event of a conflict between daycare regulations and emergency health guidance promulgated or taken from law by the New York State Department of Health in the interest of public health during a designated public health emergency, such emergency guidance must be followed. And I just want to remind um, everyone watching us that if you are ever, ever in doubt for everyone's safety, it's really best to just err on the side of caution and send that person home. Absolutely. Now, Sherry, another important document that we all need to be aware of, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, that we'd get to it, so here we are, and that is the New York State Forward Safety Plan, and OCFS refers to this as the Business Reopening Safety Plan Template. Now, this is a required written safety plan outlining how the workplace will prevent the spread of COVID-19. And You can use the New York Forward Safety Plan Template or you can develop your own. And the template, again, can be found on the OCFS website as well as your My Activities page. All right, so Casey, we have another question from the mailbox, and this one's about the safety plan. And does it need to be filed with the Office of Children and Family Services? Excellent question. Um, it does not need to be submitted to a state agency for approval, but it must be kept on the premises of the program and must be made available to New York State Department of Health or local health or safety authorities, such as the Office of Children and Family Services, in the event of an inspection. And it also needs to be posted conspicuously in the program. All right, good information. So it looks like we have another question, and again, this one's about the safety plan. Does everyone need to fill it out, even if they never closed during the pandemic? That's another great question, really great questions. Um, all programs are uh, required to conspicuously post the completed safety plans on site for employees. Okay, so uh, let's move into, I think we've covered the site safety plan in depth. So going along with that, the site safety monitor. And under the screening and testing section of the processes portion of the interim guidance document, it talks about a site safety monitor, and it states, child care programs must designate a site safety monitor whose responsibilities include continuous compliance with all aspects of the site safety plan. Okay. Here it is, our favorite time. Hey, Trish. Oh, yes, it is. Whole yeah. time. Okay, so according to the wording of the guidance that Sherry just shared, is a site safety monitor a requirement or a recommended best practice? And I'll go ahead and read that again. Child care programs must designate a site safety monitor whose responsibilities include continuous compliance with all aspects of the site safety plan. And they're off. It's just fun to participate. This one is going pretty quick, ladies. Yeah, we're, we're only about 40 seconds in. Well, uh, I can tell you, even <laughs> that quickly, I think uh, most of us have already answered, and it's pretty fairly tilted one way. Shall I close up? Sure, go ahead, close the poll, and I want to thank everyone for their quick responses. We love when you play along with us. And it is, you guys do a great job of breaking down why it's one way or the other, and I'm going to let you do that one more time. Just about a couple seconds here to register that answer. Click Submit. And here we are. All right, this is 
pretty pretty clear that everyone is understanding that this is a requirement. And if you didn't know why you chose it, I'm going to tell you that right now. According to the wording, must designate a site safety monitor, and that must word makes it a requirement. But I bet you all knew that. So we've heard some, um, some interesting things from the field that many programs are designating a variety of different people in this role. So a home-based provider, a director could be in this role, an assistant director, or even in some instances, a lead teacher could be in this position. Wonderful. Now, Sherry, you know, we recognize that these are challenging mm -hmm. times, and the goal of this guidance is to help everyone determine safe ways to care for children to keep everybody healthy. Now, uncertain times, you know, they really have us all wondering about a lot of things. But we all know that with kindness and gratitude and support, things are better. So we recently heard from many professionals in the field who wanted to pass on some messages of hope to all of us. So let's watch. We've made great new relationships uh, with families and children that we wouldn't have, um, you know, had the opportunity to otherwise. Um, so, very grateful for that. Well, I just want to say to school age programs, daycares, anyone who's providing care for children, we see you, we hear you, we support you, we love you. I come from this field, I know what it feels like, I know how difficult it probably is right now to not have that contact directly with the children, but the things that you're doing to still be in contact with these families and the children is so great and I'm so proud of how we've all come together to make this difficult time easier. Again, I just want to make sure that you guys know we see, we hear, and we love you and we're here to support you. I'm here to support all programs. I've been there, I know what it feels like. So we're here for you guys. You know, together we can, you know, get through all of this. <laughs> if there's this really cool response of human nature that's coming out, in the beginning of all of this, we heard a lot of like tragedy and gloom and oh no, it's gonna be bad. and that whole negative thing and I think now there's like you know kids creating like podcasts or little internet shows of like what was good today you know um, those kind of ideas and opportunities tapping into that creativity of what are we grateful for see I mean I'm so proud to be a part of this region I mean they are it, it, it's amazing what the providers are doing um, it's um, more than ever we all need to be, just need to stay together and just work together and I'm just amazed, honestly. The best part of my day is, you know, seeing how excited the children get to see those staff. Um, we have consistent staff every day, so, um, you know, we're all in this to, together and everyone can feel it. I feel like our child care professionals have always felt not professional and I think if we come away from here feeling like I am a teacher, I, I have an important role to play in society, that message is important to me, as too is the message of making sure we have a healthy village. We don't just need a village, we need the village to be healthy. So if those two things are conveyed, I, I would feel very good. Stay strong, to try to meet every morning with a smile and know that each day is a step closer to getting back together. As difficult as this is, your being here right now um, is, is really critical. And it's critical because you're keeping kids in relationship. Relationship is what ties us all together, right? Um, so if, if the end goal is to get to a point either with, with this COVID thing that we're going through, or if it's to get through whatever trauma that that child is, has faced in their life. What we, what we have to do is we have to help kids see that. We have to help kids um, get a sense that there's a path there and that, that we can do something together to move down that path. And your relationship is how you do that. It's about staying in relationship with that child. Thank you so much for being 
where you are with the children and the families that you that you are um they won't forget this um so thank you so much for that go get them go get them providers we just all need to hang in there and just keep working together and when we do come back when this all ends we need to continue the way that we're that that we're what we're doing right now we can continue doing that because this is like this is grade a you know this is great a stuff the love that we have that that i'm seeing is we need to carry it on when we do end up coming back together we know that we are thinking about each other we're thinking about our you know kids that we can't be with the families that you know we want to be back together with and just you know let people know that we're out here with you and we're going to be back together soon if ever before you doubted the fact that you are needed to help us all as a society, I want you to remember you are worthy and you are enough. You, sometimes we are called babysitters. Sometimes we're called childcare providers. I call you teacher because someone who imparts knowledge to another one is a teacher. And when you teach a little one how to not poop in his diaper and put that in the toilet, you are a teacher. And so I want you to remember you are worthy and you are enough. Teachers make every other profession possible. And right now, even if in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, you are helping a child find his occupation or her occupation. And I want you to remember that. We are going to get through this. And one of the things that I have become very aware of is how the public and the world really has become, uh, has understood how important the work you do is as an early childhood educator and teachers, but also a new appreciation of doctors, nurses, people who work in the grocery store, the pharmacy, bus drivers, delivery people, mailmen. Everybody suddenly is being recognized as playing a really important role in the lives of one another. And this is a real opportunity to create a new reality. A reality where we suddenly understand, because I don't think we have for a very long time, that we're, when we care about each other, that what we do makes a difference and it not only affects us, but it affects everybody else, not only in our lives, but in the world. You know, Sherry, that is one of my absolute favorite videos. I love that video. And this morning, actually, someone reached out to me. They were having a rough day. And I told them, you know, stop, take a breath, and remember, you are worthy and you are enough. So, so powerful. Cert certainly is very powerful. And it just, I, I, I take a different message every single time I watch it. I do as well. And we really do want to thank everyone for taking their time to share with us those very powerful and uplifting messages of hope with us. Uh, Sherry, it looks like I've got another question here from the mailbox. And people are wondering if the new OCFS forms are available in languages other than English. Ah, this is an easy question. Um, <laughs> all of the new forms can be found on the OCFS website in both English and Spanish and they are currently being translated into both traditional and simplified Chinese. Great. Now I'm going to reach out to our friend Trish and uh, just check in with her to see if she's got any other late-breaking uh, emails from the mailbox. Just a few, Case, and I just want to let you know on a personal note that video did work. I actually feel much better now. Thank you. Right in the feels. <laughs> Couple of questions quickly. If a group is static, is it okay for them to share materials or do we have to have individual supply bins? The answer, materials can and should be shared within that static or stable group of children. Just be sure to follow your daily cleaning and sanitizing guidelines. One more, uh, actually two more. What is the temperature that does not allow entrance into a program? 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher is that exclusion temperature. 
also many questions on how to clean. The answer here is you want to adhere to your hygiene, cleaning, and disinfection requirements for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Department of Health. You need to maintain those logs on site that document the date, time, and scope of the cleaning and disinfection. This, by the way, goes for inside and outside the program. In case there's a few more, just want to mention to folks, we will get back to each of you individually, but I think, ladies, we're out of time for this today. Okay, so thank you again to everybody for uh, sending those in, and thank you, Trish, for uh, sharing those with us. Now, we have covered a lot of important and valuable material during our time together, and as Trish does did just mention, if we didn't get to your questions, someone will follow up with you. And I know that one question that we get a lot is about our training certificates, and we want to let you know that those certificates will be processed at the end of this live training and will be available on your My Activities page on your ECETP account in 24 to 36 hours. And we do want to mention that uh, if you are watching a recorded version of this training, there will not be a training certificate issued. It's only for the live trainings. That is very good information. And another question we get is, how can I get copies of the videos? So this training, um, as mentioned, will be available to view again in the coming days on the ECETP website. And you can find many, many other informative videos like the ones you just saw here on our Early Childhood Education and Training Program YouTube channel. So you'll want to go to YouTube, search ECETP, and hit that subscribe button on the channel. You're ready to view and share with your friends. Wonderful. Now, Sherry, we would like to just one more time thank everyone who took the time to share with us in those videos their best practices and their messages of hope. And we'd like to thank everyone for participating with us uh, through those polls and through our mailbox. And we really hope that this training is a starting point and has been helpful to you in understanding the guidance that's been issued. And we encourage you to work with your regulator and ask for their assistance in helping you and your program meet the requirements that have been laid out. This relationship is a cooperative one, and the regulators and staff of the Office of Children and Family Services are eager to help you meet this challenge head on. Oh, Casey, they certainly are ready to help everyone meet this challenge. So also during this training you have been emailed a link to the participant reaction questionnaire also known as the PRQ. Mm -hmm. And we really do want to encourage everyone to fill that out for us. We do read all of those um, and it really gives us value in valuable information about this training as well as lets us know about other topics you're interested in, and they really help us shape future training opportunities. So we really appreciate it if you go to your mailbox, click on that link, and complete that PRQ for us. And again, I just want to take another moment and thank all of you for attending, taking your time on this Friday afternoon, and please stay safe. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Trish. Thank you, everybody, and everybody have a great day.